Looks great, thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much everybody for joining us today. Uh, I will talk a little bit about handwriting analysis, some of the work uh, that we did in CSAFE 1.0 and what we are hoping to achieve in CSAFE 2.0. So um, the, we had one project with two main uh, sort of wings, if you will, uh, during CSAFE uh, 1.0 in terms of handwriting. Um, the one project was led by Hal Stern at UCI and another one was led by me at Iowa State. Uh, the project that was led by Hal was a collaboration uh, with the um, Los Angeles Fol Police Department. And what they focused on at the time uh, was uh, research on um, handwriting complexity, in particular uh, signature complexity. So. Um, the question is, does the accuracy of the examiner um, uh, vary if you have more or less complex signatures? That's one question. And the other question is, how um, consistent are the uh, subjective evaluation of complexity of a signature when you present the same signature to many examiners? Um, do they all come up with the same um, uh, assessment more or less? And so some of the accomplishments uh, in, this, uh, in this work were um, a research paper on the reliability of uh, signature complexity assignments. Um, I should know where this was published, but we'll ask Hal afterwards uh, where this paper has appeared. Uh, there's a manuscript in preparation, a draft manuscript that uses uh, machine learning uh, technologies or learning algorithms to uh, to do an assessment of signature complexity and um, that takes, or at least hopes to take out a little bit of the subjective uh, part of it. And um, the, the, um, the UCI group uh, consulted on the design of a study to answer that second question that I had, which is, that I posed, which is uh, relating complexity to uh, handwriting expert analysis. At Iowa State, we took a different uh, tack. So we are looking not at signatures, but at uh, uh, longer pieces of writing, if you will, samples of writing. Um, the question that we ask is, if we have a closed set of writers and a question document, can we estimate the probability of writership for each one of those uh, writers in the closed set so that we can try to allocate the question documents to the writer, uh, potential writer with the highest posterior probability of actually having authored that document. And so in the process of uh, doing that, we developed a piece of uh, software called Handwriter that is in the public domain. So if anybody's interested, you can find Handwriter, um, you can link to Handwriter from the uh, CSAFE uh, webpage. I should say it's not finished, we're still working on it, but it works. Um, so what Handwriter does is it analyzes handwriting images and extracts uh, features for use in uh, a statistical model. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this in the next few slides. Um, there's a research manuscript that we wrote and submitted to statistical analysis and data mining. Uh, reviews, uh, a revision was requested and we are in the process of submitting a revision. So pretty soon we should be able to share this uh, paper. Um, we have developed, we, Amy Crawford, Dr. Amy Crawford, one of our new PhD students. Um, she actually developed, uh, did her dissertation on the basis of this work. I should say two graduate students, Nick Berry, who finished his uh, PhD last year, the year before, uh, he was handwriter, the development of handwriter was part of his dissertation. And Amy, uh, part of her dissertation was uh, working on a statistical model for estimating that probability that I was talking about. There's a couple of research manuscripts in preparation and I'll say something about her methodology in a minute. We have collected data uh, the data that are already available is from about 100 participants, but by now we have increased the number of participants and we continue collecting this data. Each one of these participants uh, provided 
we were asked, they were asked to copy three different prompts, three different times on each of three different occasions that were separated by about three weeks. So what this data set does is it allows, the, the data set was constructed so that we could look at the intra-writer variability uh, the, in the future as we add to this database, we're thinking about uh, maybe changing the design a little bit of the uh, data collection so that we can also look at the inter uh, between writer variability in addition to that. There's a manuscript that describes this data that was published in uh, Data in Brief. And uh, there have been multiple presentations uh, done from uh, this work. So a little bit about handwriter and um, and the modeling uh, approach that um, that Amy has developed. So handwriter, uh, what it does is it takes a scanned sample of um, writing, and then uh, through a series of steps, uh, converts this ends up with um, um, a series of graphs. Uh, that are obtained from the handwriting that sometimes, but not always, correspond to actual letters. And here's uh, this very nice uh, sort of progression of the pre-processing the handwriter does. And by the way, this is not the, I mean, this, this handwriter uh, is, um, we did not come up with these ideas. Uh, we uh, learned a lot from other existing software like Flash ID, for example, that does something very similar. Handwriter does different things, but uh, in the same spirit. So take an image of handwriting and end up with a series of graphical structures uh, that can then be used for statistical analysis. At the here, the step E, for example, you see what handwriter uh, does. Uh, essentially, it uh, defines um, nodes and edges, and nodes are defined as terminal nodes, and then anytime uh, three or more edges cross, uh, there's a series of rules that Handwriter uh, follows in order to come up with uh, these graphical structures, and all of those are described in this manuscript that is under revision at this moment. In any event, once uh, uh, this is not still inside handwriter, but it's going to be at the end of the summer. Once you have these graphical structures, uh, one of the, the next step is to uh, group them into similar, uh, into clusters, if you will, uh, that have, that include all similar, not identical structures. So for example, uh, so what we do is we use something called a k-means uh, clustering algorithm uh, which is a dynamical uh, clustering approach. And what you end up with is clusters. Here's a sample of those clusters um, where you have an exemplar that I'm showing you uh, in red. And then all the little um, gray, uh, the smudgy grays around them are other uh, graphs that ended up in the same cluster. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of variability within each cluster in terms of what ends up um, in a cluster. So this is, gives you a lot of flexibility. One of the, I think one of the big advantages of our approach is that you start with thousands of different graphical structures, but once you cluster them, we end up with uh, 40 clusters of uh, similar graphical structures. 40 is an arbitrary number. We're working on seeing whether uh, that makes, there's a better, uh, more principled way to picking the number of clusters with which you work. So the data that we use uh, then are uh, shown below. So we have 40 clusters. And uh, for example, for writer one, document one, uh, we cl the cluster one, this writer contributed 42 graphs to cluster one, 21 graphs to cluster two, and so on and so forth. And so for each one of the writers in our set, we end up with the frequencies with which they contribute graphs to each one of these clusters. So um, that's the main piece of information we have about each writer and the hypothesis is that um, the frequency with which they contribute graphs to each one of these clusters is, um, is discriminating. In other words, we can uh, tell writers apart by looking at those frequencies. 
In addition to those frequencies, and those are uh, document level features, we also look at writer level features. So for example, um, let's take this one cluster that I'm showing you here. Uh, the, the exemplar is this straight line, but as you can see, there's, there's uh, other uh, elements in this cluster that have more or less slant. So the other thing that we look at is the slant uh, within cluster of the graphs that are contributed by each writer. And so for example, for writer one cluster one, 31, which is this one, uh, we look at the angles, the rotation angles um, with respect to the horizontal that um, of all the graphs that this uh, person contributed to that particular cluster. And you can see a distribution of rotation angles uh, we use something called a wrapped Cauchy distribution to model uh, those rotation angles on the circle. And we include those that information in the modeling as well. I'm going to spare you the model. Uh, so let me tell you what the output from that model looks like. So this is an example where I have 90 writers, 90 potential writers for, our, for this one question document. And so then the potential writers are in the x-axis. And um, the question document, of course, we know ground truth. We know that that question document was written by uh, writer 85, who's right here. And the model assigns 72% probability to writer 85 as the author of that particular document. It also assigns 12% probability to writer number four and then smidgens of probability to other writers. So 0.01 to writer one and 0.03 to writer 71 and so on. So this is what we get for one question document. When we look, and this is a, I cheated because this is a different data set. This is here we created a, a set of potential writers that included not only the CSAFE writers, but also a sample of writers obtained from the CVL database of writers, of writing, uh, handwriting samples. And what you see here is uh, on the y-axis are the question documents. And there's one, the collection, there's 160 potential writers here and 160 question documents. Each one of the question documents was authored by each one of these uh, potential writers. And so what we want to see is that the actual author is assigned most of the probability of writership. And so what we would love to see is uh, dark blue on the diagonal here, which uh, means that the correct writer was identified as the author of the, each one of those question documents and nothing on the off diagonal. And so what you see here is that in most cases with a couple of exceptions, so there's an exception here, uh, there's another exception here, um, and there's another exception here. So for three of the writers out of 160, we did not identify the correct, so for three of the question document out of 160, we did not identify the correct writer. Um, and so, uh, but you see that we're doing pretty well. So the, the result is that 97% um, of the total probability is on the diagonal here and uh, less than 3% is in the off diagonal. Uh, and so um, here's a credible set. So 97.3 plus minus whatever it is. Um, uh, so uh, this has, the accuracy is pretty good. It can be improved, but it's pretty good. Um, did I go in the right direction? Oh yeah, so some of the, uh, so that was what I wanted to say about uh, the methodology. Uh, the impact uh, I think has been the uh, uh, creation of open source software that uh, can be used to analyze handwriting. Um, it's, uh, you know, handwriter is definitely not as sophisticated and doesn't have the same type of functionality as something like Flash ID, but uh, it works very well and uh, might be a resource uh, in addition to Flash ID for, uh, for, uh, for examiners. Uh, publicly available data, uh, that's a significant new resource. Although I have to say that handwriting is one of the few disciplines, forensic disciplines where data have been produced uh, 
in the past and are available. And then novel methodological uh, analysis uh, methods um, and publications, both on the signature complexity question and on the analysis of handwriting samples uh, in a closed set. So moving forward, uh, we will continue. So moving forward, the project moves uh, exclusively to Iowa State. Uh, the, the handwriting, uh, the signature portion is uh, on pause at this moment. Um, the objectives are uh, mostly to expand and enhance the model that we have for estimating probability of ridership. And what do I mean by that? I mean identifying uh, new features that might help us in increase that uh, accuracy of the classifier. Um, that's one of those things. And we have several things and uh, several things in the works. Um, revised handwriter uh, to produce a beta version that, that is well documented and well commented so that people can start playing with it uh, and fix a couple of bugs. And then uh, continuing uh, collecting uh, standard writing samples from a large set of writers. Our hope is to end up with about 600 writers in our data set uh, by the end of the next three years or so. Um, we have a great team. Um, the, the, oh, I should have said, that. I forget one thing here. So, um, well, never mind. So we have a great team. Uh, the co-PIs here are myself and Danica Oman uh, at ISU. Uh, we have uh, a crew that includes uh, undergraduates and graduate students and uh, NEST collaborators and, um, and uh, all kinds of uh, people. So let me just say Ali, uh, Arabio, she's an undergraduate at Cedar College that's working with us for the summer. Dr. Amy Crawford uh, just completed her PhD. She's off to work in the real world. We hope to continue working with her anyway. Maddie Johnson is a graduate student in statistics at Iowa State. She's joining us uh, for CSAFE 2.0. Dr. Lotsam Kaplan uh, is in Israel and uh, hopefully we can rope her into this project. James Cruz is a graduate student at Iowa State um, in criminology. He's been with the project from the very beginning. John Leibert at NIST, we had the pleasure of meeting him yesterday. We look forward to working with him. Maddie McGregor, she's an undergraduate at Columbia College in Missouri. She's also going to join us for the summer. Um, Robert Ramotowski, you've met from NIST. Uh, he is, of course, uh, question document examiner, so we look forward to interacting with him. Anisha Ray is an undergraduate in statistics. Um, she's also been working with the project for a while. And James Taylor is an undergraduate in computer science and something else uh, at Iowa State, and he is a whiz at programming. And of course, Gary Licht from the Iowa Department of Criminal Investigations has been a great resource for us, and we will continue bugging him. Um, so I think uh, this is, the plan is uh, um, pretty clear. We want to better understand limitations of the current modeling approach. Uh, I've mentioned this where, for example, do we have the right number of clusters uh, for, the, for the type of writing we're analyzing. Uh, explore the utility of adding uh, document level and graph level features to the probability model uh, that's uh, ongoing. This is the biggie one, uh, relax the requirement that the set of potential writers be closed. And so uh, we've been thinking about ways in which we can continue, we can marry uh, a numerical approach with a principal statistical approach uh, to come up with uh, ways of uh, being able to consider an open close, an open set of writers. Uh, extensively stressed as handwriter, uh, validated, um, hopefully produce a well-documented beta version that the community uh, will be willing to play with, uh, help us test, and uh, design a quality metric from ha for handwriting that can be included as part of the estimate of probability of writership. And this is probably going to be something that relies on looking at the within writer variability relative to the between writer variability and our database is uh, pretty well um, designed for this purpose. So um, 
there's at least three ways in which uh, participation and input by the question document examiners community will be critical. Uh, we would love to talk about the handwriting samples that we have been collecting and uh, discuss with you better ways of uh, include more realistic uh, handwritten samples to our database. At some point, not yet, but maybe next year, we'd like to have a large group of examiners willing to play with handwriter. And then at some point in the future, uh, see whether we can calibrate handwriter relative to uh, question document examiners assessments. So um, when handwriter says this, this is the probability that this person is the author of this document, what would the examiner say? And are we more or less in uh, agreement with what the examiner say? So we mean for handwriter not to replace the examiner, but to be uh, a tool that the examiner can use to either confirm or uh, not confirm his or her assessment. So thank you so much. I probably went over time. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we welcome your insights, your suggestions, uh, your participation. Uh, we can always be reached through our website, forensicstats.org. Uh, feel free to write to my private email address as well. I'm done. Thank you, Alicia. It looks like there is a question in the Q&A, if you click in the bottom of your screen. Uh, let me stop sharing, yes. From Roy, how do you assign a conf uh, Roy Maxion, how do you assign a confidence to the handwriting results? Uh, also from Roy, how much handwriting? Ah, that's a good one. Uh, how long a string or sentence does a subject have to write? So uh, let me start with the second one because that's the easy one. Um, this is an excellent question, and in fact, what I did not show was another study that Amy did, where she compared. Um, the accuracy as the amount of question handwriting became uh, smaller and smaller and smaller. So for example, when the, had, when the question document included four sentences, um, the method did really well. When it included three sentences, more or less of the same length, uh, it still did very well. By the time we got to one sentence with about, I don't know, 10 words or eight words, then uh, the method collapsed and the, um, I mean, it didn't completely collapse, but the accuracy went down from the high 90s to like 80 something, I think it was, I should, or no, less than that, 60 something or 50 something. Um, and the reason of course, is that when you, when your main information is the frequency with which people, a writer contributes graphs to 40 clusters, by the time you get to a sentence, the number of graphs that are extracted from that sentence are very, is very, very small. And so most of those frequencies ended up being zeros. And so uh, what we're looking at is, do we have to have different number of clusters if we want to analyze different size of question documents? And so stay tuned, Roy, uh, we're working on that. And the answer is, um, yeah, it makes a difference and we're seeing how we can address that issue. I don't understand the assigned confidence to handwriting results. Are you talking about that credible set that I presented? Um, that comes, that was computed numerically. So the model, the probability model that Amy came up with was fitted using something called MCMC. And so in each one, um, Never mind. We can actually compute. So we end up with a distribution of the total probability observed in the diagonal. Uh, and so from that distribution, we can look at a 95% credible set. I hope I'm answering your question. Um, yeah, the next question is actually from someone who raised their hand. Linda, do you have a question you'd like to ask? Yes, um, thank you. You mentioned um, earlier in your presentation that one of the things that you were looking at was the intra writer variation. Yes. And, um, I'm interested in that and I'm curious, mm. did you guys do any quantification of that per writer? Yes. Um, 
I should let Amy, uh, Amy, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, why don't you respond to that one? Um, so we, we haven't set up necessarily a formal study to, to capture intra-writer variability specifically. Um, we're, we're thinking of ways we can use our current modeling structure to investigate um, aspects of intra-writer variability, but I think there's the really interesting room to grow with this data set that we've collected. We've got a lot of repetitions for each uh, contributor to the data set, um, and we've got, we've got contributions over three different set writing sessions, and each session took place three weeks apart um, in time. So we haven't, you know, we haven't sat down to look at, um, you know, specifically for that task, we've been focusing mostly on the writer identification task in the closed set. Uh, so th there's really interesting room um, to grow more formally with an intra-writer variability study. Yeah, one thing that I will add, thank you, Amy. One thing that I will add to that is that um, one thing, you know, we could look at the intra-writer variability in different uh, aspects, right? So one of them would be what's the variability within a writer in terms of the frequency with which this writer contributes graphs to the clusters, that's one. Uh, the one that would be, uh, would be easy to look at is, uh, for example, the slant. Uh, so we do fit a distribution to the slant angles uh, within writer, for each writer in a cluster. And so that, gives you, I mean, once we fit that distribution, we have a variance. And so that would be one easy way to look at intra-writer variability in that specific aspect, which is not the most interesting one, but that's the way uh, one can think about going for it. I think, I think it would also be really interesting to see if you have particular writers that have um, larger variation within their samples, if if as the quantity of writing decreases, your um, accuracy of identifying the right person is affected, I think it would be really interesting to correlate, especially those um, samples that you had mentioned in, in your study that didn't um, fall directly on that diagonal line. Do those writers have greater variation? Because um, that could be a factor that would help to um, increase the accuracy and I think it also be really telling um, because that's an aspect of handwriting that we look at as document examiners and it, it can affect our ability to um, confidently identify or eliminate a writer as well. Thank you Linda this is really we'll be in touch <laughs> uh, but those are great suggestions. Uh, there's one question from India can I access, handwriter access the writing speed? Ah, no. So handwriter uh, does not, um, you know, it's one of those trade-offs. So handwriter uh, does not allow you to uh, see speed or pressure uh, in the writing. Um, it only looks at a static image of the writing uh, and the features we have extracted so far would not help you with writing speed. I don't know, this would be something, this, we've discussed how, what my, what, how might one think about this, uh, but we haven't done anything with it. If you have any suggestions, we would be very happy to hear them. And then finally, there's a question from Roy, another question from Roy that says, does every subject write the same thing or do they write whatever they want? Uh, so in our data set, they, gave, they were given specific prompts. But for example, in this study where we were looking at sentences, uh, each person wrote whatever they wanted. So no, they don't have to write um, specific things. Uh, and in the CVL database, they also wrote, am I, uh, so I yeah, I can jump in on this one. Um, so in the CSAFE database, each participant wrote the same three prompts over and over and over and over again. Um, in CVL, they wrote, um, some wrote uh, six, some wrote, some wrote seven, and some wrote five of the same prompt, just once. 
Um, and in that, the last database, when we were talking about using sentences, that's the IAM database, uh, the, the writers uh, were given prompts. They, so they had, they had content to write, but it was not um, ever repeated. So it was, um, I can't remember which, the, uh, it was the LOB corpus. Um, uh, prompts were taken sequentially from books and, and essays in the LOB corpus. And so writers were just given content to write, you know, sequentially from essays and things like that. So none of the, the content was repeated. Thank you, Amy. I think those were the questions. Uh, oh, there's another one <laughs> uh, from Roy. What is a prompt? <laughs> a prompt, Roy, is anything you ask them to write. So for example, uh, the London letter, which is a paragraph that, ever, that has been used a lot because it includes every letter, cap and small and every number and a lot of punctuation symbols and so on. That's a very commonly used prompt. And prompt just means here, copy this paragraph. I think that's... Uh, Linda has one more comment in the webinar chat. Um, Alicia, can you see the chat or would you like me to read the comment? Uh, hold on a minute. Um, I should see the chat. Oh, Linda. Maybe interesting to increase your writing database robustness together writing using multiple types, types of writing instruments, also lined or unlined paper. So the writing instrument, um, that's a, that's a, that goes along with a question from the Indian uh, participant. Um, the, the handwriter uh, is designed to sort of blow over a writing instrument. So when the uh, image of the handwriting is processed, um, what, uh, what handwriter does is it creates a skeleton of the handwriting that is one pixel wide. And so whether you start with really chunky writing uh, from a Sharpie or a very fine writing from a very fine instrument, you end up with a one pixel representation of the handwriting. Now that's a trade-off, right? So this is one of, the, one of the choices that we had to make when developing Handwriter. Uh, it doesn't help you to identify or include that variability that's due to writing instrument. Amy, jump in if you... Yeah, so I, I think for external use, you know, if somebody else were to come and want to use our database, because it is set up really well for intra-writer variability study, um, you know, it might be useful for others to have different writing instruments or, or paper to, you know, and things like that. We were trying really hard to control those aspects of the database so that we could really get a handle on the, the structure of the writing um, itself. Uh, we didn't want, you know, we didn't want the pen to have anything to do with it or the paper or anything like that. We just wanted, we wanted to get at the writing, the structure of the writing itself. And so we controlled um, those aspects in our data collection. And for us, you know, the, the utensil, like, like Alicia was saying, doesn't matter much. Um, and so we kind of designed our, our, our data collection for, for our writer identification task. Um, but for others, external users of the data set, that would be something that could be useful. Yeah, in fact, we sent the participants, we sent them the paper and we sent them the pen. <laughs> this is how much we wanted to control the, uh, those aspects. But thank you for your comments, Linda. Okay, we'll go ahead and conclude the morning session of the CSAFE 2020 All Hands meeting. Thank you to Alicia and the handwriting group and the other groups that presented this morning. Um, and thank you to the participants for joining us. We will take a 15 minute break at this point and return at 12.30 p.m. Central. So approximately a 15 minute break now. Um, our next session is Lynn Garcia and she will be providing um, some keynote comments for today's meeting and we're very excited to hear from her. So please join us in approximately 15 minutes and Lynn Garcia with our keynote um, for today's conference. Thank you.